To start things off, we're first going to have to talk about what hydrazine sulfate is and why we're even making it. Hydrazine sulfate is the salt version of hydrazine, and on the left we can see the free base hydrazine, and on the right we can see what the hydrazine sulfate looks like. There is a reason why we're making hydrazine sulfate and not the pure form, and this is because pure hydrazine is actually explosive, volatile, and pretty toxic. Hydrazine sulfate, on the other hand, is a powder instead of a liquid, so it doesn't have the volatility issue. It's also not explosive, and it's not nearly as toxic. All of these factors together make it much safer to work with, especially if it's going to be something that's done at home. Hydrazine sulfate is capable of doing all of the same reactions as freebase hydrazine. The hydrazine sulfate is added to a reaction, and the freebase is liberated in the reaction itself. Like I said before, this technique allows us to avoid handling pure hydrazine. So now on to the question of why we're even making this to begin with. Why do we need any form of hydrazine? This molecule is pretty unique, and as you can see, it's pretty much just NH2 linked to another NH2. In chemistry, this opens up the ability for a lot of different cool reactions, and it's actually the precursor for a lot of pharmaceuticals. I'm definitely going to use it in a variety of different reactions in the future, but my main purpose of making it was as a precursor to luminol. Making luminol is several steps, and the step that this is used in is the reaction with 3-nitrothalic acid. I actually made the 3-nitrothalic acid in a previous video if you're interested in checking that out. Anyway, the 3-nitrothalic acid reacts with the hydrazine to form 3-nitrothalhydrazide. This intermediate is then one step away from the final luminol product, and all that needs to be done is the NO2 group has to be reduced to an NH2. I do both of these steps in one video, and that should be released in a couple of weeks. So now that we know a little bit of why I'm making the hydrazine and what the hydrazine is, we can get started with the synthesis. These are all of the ingredients needed to make hydrazine, except I forgot the sulfuric acid. So just like in another one of my videos, let's just pretend that the sulfuric acid is there. The procedure that I used was adapted from chem players, and it's pretty much the same. What I used was 500 milliliters of what was assumed to be around 5% hypochlorite, 32 grams of sodium hydroxide, 0.75 grams of gelatin, 22 grams of urea, and 100 milliliters of 50-50 sulfuric acid. I don't show how the 50-50 sulfuric acid's made, but it's done by adding 50 milliliters of concentrated sulfuric acid to 50 milliliters of water. This is extremely exothermic, and the water must be cooled at the same time, otherwise it will boil. When this is done, it's still going to be pretty hot, and it should be cooled down to at least room temperature, either using the fridge or just leaving it out for a while. For the hypochlorite solution, or the bleach, we assume that it's a 5.25% concentration, but this is when it's shipped. Once it arrives in the stores and it sits on the shelf, the hypochlorite degrades and it can even drop below 5%. Before I started, I tested my hypochlorite solution in the same way that I tested it in the chloroform video, and I found it to be about 4.9%. So apparently it's been sitting on the shelf for a while, even though I just bought it, but that's okay and we'll just use an excess of everything else. To start off, I added 500 milliliters of bleach to a 1 liter beaker. It's important to not fill whatever vessel you're using above halfway because there is a lot of foaming in this reaction. Sometimes it doesn't foam very much, and sometimes it foams a crazy amount, and by filling it more than halfway, you're going to be taking a risk. This is where the procedure differs a little bit from chem players, and this is because I opted to use an ice bath instead of a freezer. Both are viable options, but the ice bath offers continued cooling, and because I'm stirring it while it's in the ice bath, it's going to cool faster. In either case, we're not looking to cool the bleach to 0 C, we're looking to cool it to about 8 degrees Celsius. The next step is to add our 32 grams of sodium hydroxide. Kemplayer opted to do this by dumping in a large amount of sodium hydroxide at once, stirring, re-cooling it in the fridge or the freezer, and then adding the next portion. Because I'm using an ice bath, I'm able to keep it cool as the sodium hydroxide is added and I don't have to put it in the freezer after. 
Strong stirring in this step is very important because you don't want to create any local hot spots. It's also important to add it slowly in very small amounts so that we get no clumping. When the sodium hydroxide dissolves, it heats up, and if we don't stir it properly, it can heat up certain small areas a lot. Bleach is basically just a solution of sodium hypochlorite, which is pretty sensitive to temperature. Above 20 degrees Celsius, the degradation of the sodium hypochlorite becomes much more significant. So our goal is to keep the temperature between 8 and 20 C. It's best to keep it as far away from 20 C as possible, and I think I peaked out at around 15 C. So anyway, what we're doing here is we're basically just making a really strongly basic solution of sodium hypochlorite. After several minutes of adding small amounts of the sodium hydroxide at a time, we're finally done and I cool the solution back down to around 7 or 8 C. This will take several minutes and in the meantime I prepare my gelatin urea solution. So on the left here I have my 22 grams of urea weighed out and on the right I have my 0.75 grams of gelatin. About 15 milliliters of hot water was added to the gelatin to dissolve it. I should have done the proper method where the gelatin is wet a bit with a small amount of water and then dissolved with the warm water. In either case though, the gelatin solution might not fully clear up and it might be a little bit cloudy, but that's okay. After mixing for a little bit and adding a bit more water, we're left with a slightly cloudy solution of gelatin. To the urea on the left, I start adding in some more water to dissolve it as well. Unfortunately, when urea dissolves, it's endothermic and it will cool down the solution. I think I added a total of about 30 milliliters of water but the total amount doesn't have to be super precise. Just try to make sure you don't add more than 40. To dissolve everything, I put the urea solution in the microwave and I kept adding small amounts of hot water until it fully cleared up. Now that we have two clear solutions, the gelatin solution is simply dumped into the urea solution. With several quick swirls, we're left with a nice clear solution of gelatin and urea. So now we head back to our basic bleach solution. We see that it's cool to about 8C and we can take it out of the ice bath. Please be aware that cooling it down to 0C or even colder is not better and we actually want to be cooling it to about 8C. Our bleach solution is placed on a hot plate with some crazy fast stirring. Over the top we cover it with a little bit of saran wrap. Then in one quick go we pour in the entirety of our urea gelatin solution. It's very important to have extremely strong stirring and to pour the solution in all at once. Once it's added, you can see that there's an immediate color change and bubbling starts to occur. If this doesn't happen for you, just keep waiting and don't assume that no bubbling will occur because sometimes it can happen later and catch you off guard. The bubbling will start, it will get more intense and eventually peak and then start to die down. You can see that in my case I was just lucky and the bubbling wasn't too crazy. Some people do get foam that nearly reaches the top of the beaker though, so be aware of this. All of the bubbles that are coming off are mostly just CO2. What we're doing in this reaction is known as the Hoffman rearrangement, and it can also be called the Hoffman degradation. It's kind of a cool reaction, but I don't think I'm going to delve very deep into the mechanism. The most important thing to know is that we get this isocyanate intermediate. What happens in essence is the nitrogen from one side hops over and attaches to the nitrogen on the other side, and a double bond is formed between the nitrogen and the carbon. This gives our isocyanate, which immediately reacts with water and forms our carbamic acid derivative. This carbamic acid isn't very stable, and it spontaneously breaks down into CO2 and the hydrazine. When this happens, CO2 is produced, and this is where all the bubbling comes from. Every step in this reaction is an equilibrium, meaning it can go backwards and forwards. What really helps drive the reaction forward is the fact that one of the products is a gas. When the CO2 and the hydrazine form, the CO2 leaves and it's therefore not present to react with the hydrazine again and reform the carbamic acid. CO2 is also sequestered by the sodium hydroxide that's present to form sodium carbonate. Here you can see the overall reaction that's taking place where urea, sodium hypochlorite, and sodium hydroxide all react together to produce a solution of hydrazine, sodium carbonate, and sodium chloride. At this point, some of you might be wondering what the point of adding gelatin was. 
The exact purpose is not known, but it's believed that the gelatin chelates metal ions that might break down the hydrazine. Some people have found success using other metal chelators like EDTA, but without any metal chelator, the reaction doesn't work very well. This is why it's extremely important to use distilled water and not tap water. The gelatin serves to chelate the small amounts of metal ions in the reagents. Tap water has a crazy amount of metal ion contamination, and the gelatin probably won't be able to keep up. When the bubbling dies down, we're left with a solution that looks like this. At this point, the next step is to heat the solution to about 85 C for 5 minutes. The purpose of this step is to drive the reaction to completion. As the solution heats up, the solubility of carbon dioxide in the water will decrease and it will be kicked out. As I said before, this is an equilibrium reaction, and by expelling the CO2, we're preventing it from being able to go backwards. By manipulating the equilibrium in this way, we can maximize our yield of hydrazine. Luckily for us, we don't have to boil it forever, and it only takes something like 5 minutes. Even after 5 minutes, it still might bubble a lot like this, but that's okay. After the 5 minutes, it's taken off the hot plate and allowed to cool. In the heating step, the saran wrap was especially important because this prevents hydrazine from escaping into the air. And on top of this, make sure that wherever you do heat the solution, it's a well-ventilated area. Wait for it to cool to room temperature before proceeding to the next step. Again, instead of using a freezer like ChemPlayer, I simply used an ice bath. I didn't want to put something that was contaminated with hydrazine into somewhere where I store my food. The solution was left in the ice bath and stirred until it reached about 0 C. I then measured out 100 milliliters of 50-50 water to sulfuric acid. This stuff was left in the freezer, so it's probably around negative 15 C. My sulfuric acid solution is a little bit yellow because it got contaminated, but that won't affect anything in this experiment. This step is pretty tricky, and you should be very careful when you add the sulfuric acid solution. We need to add 60 milliliters of the 50-50 sulfuric acid very slowly and controlled. You can see at the beginning when I start to add it, not much happens and I got a little bit too confident. The sulfuric acid has to do three things, neutralize sodium hydroxide, neutralize sodium carbonate, and turn hydrazine into hydrazine sulfate. In the beginning, we're only neutralizing sodium hydroxide because it's a much stronger base, but as we add more, it will start to react with sodium carbonate, which produces a lot of CO2 gas. Once it starts bubbling like this, add it slow or else you can have an overflow. Like I said, I messed up and you can see that I added a little bit here and it overflowed the beaker. This is definitely not something that you want and it's something that can be easily avoided if you have just a little bit of patience. Luckily I learned from this and I started to add it using the dropper again. As I said before, we're adding 60 milliliters slow and controlled because this is how much it will take to neutralize pretty much all of the sodium hydroxide and the sodium carbonate. As we get to the end of adding the 60 milliliters, the bubbling should die down. Once all the sodium carbonate has been neutralized, we'll be mostly reacting to sulfuric acid with the hydrazine. Without the sodium carbonate, we also won't really have a bubbling risk, so we can dump the rest in pretty quickly. You can see we have a little bit more than 40 milliliters left, but when we add it to the solution, it looks like a white precipitate is forming and there's no crazy bubbling. This white precipitate is actually hydrazine sulfate, and this indicates that pretty much all of the sodium carbonate has been reacted. Just to prevent any other disasters, I add a little bit more slowly just to make sure it's safe. Once I know it's safe, I can pour the rest in and you can see a large cloud of white precipitate forming. This is our beautiful hydrazine sulfate product precipitating out. I keep stirring it for a little while just to make sure that all of the hydrazine has reacted with the acid. Afterwards, I turned off the stirring and I let the hydrazine sulfate sink to the bottom. My solution here was 15C after the neutralization because the sulfuric acid I used was extremely cold. If you used warmer sulfuric acid, you might have to cool it down in the fridge. Don't cool it down more than 15C though, or else sodium sulfate might start to crystallize out and it will contaminate your product. The solution was then filtered by vacuum filtration, but you could do gravity filtration. I just keep adding it to the filter flask, pulling a vacuum, and removing the water. After everything has been added to the filter, I pull a vacuum on it for a little bit just to try to dry things up. 
and then transfer it to a piece of paper with some paper towel underneath. Using a glass stir rod, I spread out the powder so that it can dry. Unfortunately, our product is going to be contaminated with a little bit of sodium sulfate because we couldn't do any water washing. The hydrazine sulfate is soluble in water, and if we washed it with water, we would lose quite a bit. I figured the amount of contamination was low though, and not really worth my time to purify it further. When it was dry, I transferred it to a watch glass, and the yield was 20.25 grams. The yield that I got was about 48%, which is extremely close to the yield that ChemPlayer got, which was around 49. I imagine that my yield could have been 49, maybe even 50, if I didn't have that overflow accident. In any case, I found this was the best method to make hydrazine, and it's clearly quite reproducible. There are other methods that start from pool chlorinating agent instead of bleach. A lot of people seem to have success with it, but I personally tried it using HTH chlorine tablets, and it failed. Effectively, in the end though, it's the same, and instead of relying on bleach or, you know, store-bought sodium hypochlorite, you're making it yourself. The pool pellets, which are calcium hypochlorite, are reacted with sodium carbonate to produce calcium carbonate and sodium hypochlorite. The calcium carbonate will precipitate out and leave behind a fresh solution of sodium hypochlorite. The calcium carbonate is then filtered off, we're left with a solution of sodium hypochlorite, and we proceed in the exact same method that I proceeded in this video. This entire filtering process and separation took about 2-3 to three hours, whereas when I started from bleach, the entire process was 1, maybe 2. It's really only for people who don't have access to bleach, but I don't really see how that's possible if you have access to pool chlorinating agents. Anyway, that's all I have to say for now. I will get on to editing the Luminol video, and that should be up in a couple of weeks. In the meantime, I'll try to find some other cool reactions or cool things to do with the hydrazine sulfate. Again, here's a list of the videos that I'm currently editing and future videos I plan to film. In the videos being edited category, you can vote for the one that you want me to publish next, and in the future video category, you can vote for the one that you want me to film next. Also, if you're feeling generous, please donate to my Patreon account, because with a bigger budget per video, I can do more things. Also, instead of stockpiling videos, I've decided I'm going to publish them as soon as I edit them, so in the next month or so, there's going to be a lot of videos coming out. On my Patreon, I also added a milestone, and if we get to $250 per video, I'll commit to doing videos for at least 6 months.